Is it locking onto me or is it locking onto the lava lamp? Because that's quite the difference. G'day friends! Today we're going to knit monkey socks designed by Cookie A. I'm using loops and threads snugly striped sock yarn in the colorway Heraldic. Up until now you've probably noticed that the most modern things I've knit on the channel have been timeless classics like socks, mitts, and hats. Stay tuned, there's an explanation and it all has to do with pop music and Canadian radio. To set the scene, I was living in Toronto. I started my first year of art college in 1995. I just spent a couple of years living in Canada's Northwest Territories after almost 10 years living in a small town in Ontario's Ottawa Valley. So this was my first real exposure to anything other than community radio. Community radio of the 1980s and 90s, for those who didn't experience, it was probably the most straight-laced, generic, middle-of-the-road programming you could find, at least in Canada. You had your usual quota of family-friendly hits of the past 30 or 40 years, a weekly request show, and the one concession to modern times, the weekly top 40. There was your headline news, usually pre-recorded by the CBC or a sister station, talk shows, farm reports, and the occasional dramatic radio presentation. Oh, and a certain amount of the music played on air in Canada has to be Canadian. This wasn't really a problem in the 80s and 90s, as Canadian music was actually pretty popular. I grew up listening to Platinum Blonde, Honeymoon Suite, the Northern Pikes, Toronto, Kim Mitchell, and the ongoing dramatic battle for the pop charts between Brian Adams and Corey Hart. The 90s saw crash test dummies, Biff Naked, and the Bare Naked Ladies all rise to prominence. Bare Naked Ladies caused quite a stir, let me tell you. In the late 80s, early 90s, most of Canada seemed a country so closeted it might as well be Narnia. It was certainly snowy enough in the winter. It was a place where a 15-year-old could innocently sing High School Confidential and have no idea what the band name Rough Trade referred to or find it odd that a woman was singing about her feelings for another teenage girl. By contrast, putting the stark words Bare Naked Ladies on a marquee was just a step too far. Kinda makes you think, eh? When I lived in Ontario, if I was really lucky, I could tune in a program from one of the repeaters out of Ottawa. That's how I managed to listen to the occasional Dr. Demento show and dance hits out of Gatineau al Quebec. To this day, I still have a soft spot for Mitsu's Bye Bye Mon Cowboy. Look it up, it's a bop. Or it slaps, whatever the kids are saying these days. It's also hilarious, but I'm a Canadian with a fading memory of bilingualism, so your mileage may vary. All this to say that living in Toronto in the 1990s was a bit of culture shock. Pretty sure the look on my face the first time I heard Nine Inch Nails Closer, a non-radio edit to boot, was priceless, and local station CFNY 102.1 The Edge played it fairly often. Like, often enough to annoy my roommate so much that she'd play the local oldie station in the living room in retaliation. The Edge also played an hour-long program every Sunday night that very quickly caught my attention. For years, the only way I could hear anything other than the blandest, most inoffensive songs ever to air on Canadian radio was to either go to a friend's house and watch much music or hope that a preview weekend would bring it into our home. Because you could hear Brian Adams and Loverboy twice an hour, but Depeche Mode was fancy words for English guys in makeup. It's not. It's French for hurry up fashion, which loses something in the translation, but for an 80s band name was magnificent. Here was a radio station that was not only giving me all the alternative music I could handle, it was giving me more. The radio program in question was, and still is, the ongoing history of new music, hosted by Alan Cross, a former disc jockey and radio producer turned modern music historian. On any given week, you can tune in for topics as diverse as alternative rock star biographies, episodes charting the rise and fall of popular bands, and strange sidebars into music and medicine, the history of moshing, or, not for the faint of heart, outsider music. If you haven't experienced Captain Beefheart's trout mask replica, are you really living your best life? I cannot go back to your frown land.
In the original format, Cross alternated playing music with contemporary music history, interesting anecdotes, and music trivia. The show was still airing, now in a half-hour podcast format wherever quality podcasts may be found, with highly abbreviated musical clips because copyright, fair use, and all that rot. I believe you can still hear the original format in total aired live on 102.1 The Edge, which is now streaming on the internet for those of us outside the Toronto region. Why do I mention the ongoing history of new music? Because I've been wanting to make a few modern items and trying to figure out a way to weave them in around historic knitting, lace making, and sewing has been a bit of a challenge. So this is the first episode of an on-again, off-again series I'd like to call The Continuing Chronicles of Contemporary Craft. I'll be exploring outstanding moments and projects in the history of modern craft, particularly knitting and other fiber arts, focusing mostly on the last large crafting spike starting in the early 2000s. I'll also include information about the antique and vintage roots of craft because everything old, as they say, is new again. Why do I get the feeling I just pitched a college dissertation and I do this stuff for fun? I often think that I came to knitting late. My grandmother attempted to teach me as a child, but for whatever reason, the ability eluded me. No matter how well she tried to explain, the extent of my yarn crafting stopped and started with a crocheted chain stitch. That is, if you don't count stitching yarn on plastic canvas, I mean, it was a thing we did back in the 80s. My actual impetus for learning was a Kittyville hat from the book Stitch and Bitch, written by Debbie Stoller and featuring the designs of many other talented knitters. The project was cute and the instructions were clearer than any other manual I'd found up to that point. The designs weren't exactly polished commercial knits, but they had a charm that appealed to the growing grassroots knitting scene of the contemporary turn of the century. <laughs> turn of the century. Rather than attempting to reproduce traditional knits, modern hobbyist designers were taking those traditional techniques and adding a grunge or late punk flair. Sure, you could knit an intarsia sweater, but why put a design of a kitten on it when you could have a roughed-in skull? Two years before I attempted to attach cat ears to what amounted to a thin hat with ear flaps and idiot strings, Amy Singer, a proofreader and hobby knitter, was growing tired of the knitting blog ring's constant unavailability. At the time, it was one of the few ways knitters could find each other and form a community, moving from one site to another to read the day's goings-on and memes. And not memes as we now know them, but things like funny graphics, quizzes, and daily questionnaires that could be answered simply, or in essay format, depending on how much you wanted to flex your intellect and typing skill. Blogs were popular in 2002, having outgrown GeoCities to find homes on other third-party servers and blogging platforms like Zanga, Blogger, and LiveJournal. In the next couple of years, blogging would be huge. Homegrown blog software such as Grey Matter and Movable Type would make way for TypePad and WordPress to come onto the scene before personal blogging took a backseat to more commercial ventures. Nitty was born in this maelstrom of technology and DIY energy. Technology enthusiasts and makers were using the new blog platforms to create their own spaces on the internet. With search engines like Yahoo, which provided categorized directories to personal blogs, you could look up all of your favorite interests. With the knitting blog circle down yet again, Amy proposed something wildly ambitious. Why not make an online magazine and community based around knitting? Patterns were always catch-as-catch-can, but if people were willing to send her designs, she could produce a magazine-style website a couple of times per year. People sent Amy patterns. Nitty's first few issues contain a lot of the same sorts of DIY tradition meets punk projects that were popular at the time, but there are glimmers of something bigger amongst the miscellaneous patterns. To this day, the Broad Street Mittens by Janice Cortez from the very first issue, a pair of modular fingerless gloves with a detachable mitten topper, is still extremely popular. The early issues are now a who's who of the knitting world. Wendy D. Johnson of Wendy Knits, Amy Swenson, former owner of Calgary Yarn Destination Make One, Stephanie Pearl McPhee, AKA the Yarn Harlot, Annie Modisset, Stephanie Jappel, Veronique Avery, and Christy Porter are all featured in the spring and summer 2003 issues. In the years to follow, many other designers would follow in their footsteps, including Vicki Howell, Sivia Harding, 
Kate Gilbert, Franklin Habit, Cookie A, Stephen West, and Isolde Teague. In an interview with Vicki Howell, Amy relates that her first priority was ensuring that Nitty could pay the bills, then the staff, and most importantly, designers. Whenever new ad revenue would come in, payments would be adjusted accordingly. Her focus has always been on ensuring designers are paid for their efforts, and while Nitty essentially licenses the right to distribute the pattern on the web, all rights remain with the designer. This is why you may find an item on Nitty as well as in a designer's physically published anthology of patterns. While Nitty does have the right to produce a published anthology of their own, Amy noted in the interview that she finds the notion of profiting in this way gross, and would rather the designer reap the most benefit. She really seems to enjoy Nitty as a venue for up-and-coming designers to showcase their talents. It's a really interesting interview, and I definitely recommend giving it a listen. Links, as always, will be in the description down below. My first introduction to Nitty was somewhere around 2004 or 2005. Amazingly enough, despite publishing for a couple of years already, it was still considered a huge new thing. An online knitting magazine. One that wasn't going to disappear at the drop of a hat. Which happened, either through mismanagement or lack of interest. At a time when you were lucky when your local supermarket stocked any of the print magazines from Interweave Press, having an online knitting magazine that published regularly was amazing. And honestly, if you could find an Interweave publication, it was usually the crochet magazine for some reason. Not dunking on crochet, but it wasn't on my radar at the time. It wasn't long before at least three of my other local friends were also knitting, and we'd message each other when the new nitty would come out, chatting on whichever instant messenger was popular at the time to ooh and ah over the covers and the patterns. We may have even bored the pants off a World of Warcraft molten core raid a time or two. That's at least 40 people for those who don't get the reference. Usually when one of our healers would go AFK for away from the keyboard for long unplanned periods of time and we'd be left twiddling our thumbs or when flying between flight points because the horde never does anything the easy way it seems. For some of us, the world stopped in winter 2005 when Nitty published Pomodamus by Cookie A. Yes, there had been other socks published, most notably the Falling Leaves pattern by Jessica Landers in fall 2005 and Thuja by Bobby Ziegler, but Pomodamus featured a twisted stitch texture in a way none of us had seen before. The sample picture was also simultaneously punk and romantic, giving all the goth feels to young netters' hearts featuring a young woman with chunky dyed black and red hair in a corset top and petticoat carrying a mannequin leg covered in fishnet and the sock sample while she gazed out over a rocky coastline. It was DIY punk, but it also looked professional as all heck. Cookie A soon became a gateway designer for new sock knitters. In quick succession, she produced Pomatimus, Hedera, and Baudelaire for Nitty, took an issue off, then was back in winter with the phenomenally popular monkey socks. She's since published three books based off her designs, and uh, subsequently disappeared off the face of the earth. I googled, in the least creepy way possible. There's no new news since 2016, which is kind of weird, but people withdraw from the internet all the time. Nothing to worry about unless I hear about it from night docs. My first Cookie A socks were a pair of Hedera. There weren't a ton of sock knitting resources online at the time, and my mum is great at sewing, but knitting was my late grandmother's thing. All mum could tell me was that she remembered heels being tricky. The instructions for turning a heel seemed somewhat convoluted to me. A relative beginner in knitting, so I looked for some personal blogs with enough pictures to illustrate the process. See, Nitty could only publish so many articles before they realized sock knitting had become a capital T thing, and let's be honest, like most men would tell you they read Playboy for the articles, uh, we were totally reading Nitty for the yarn <laughs> Give us those patterns. So my very first pair of socks were a pair of plain toe-up socks in Lorna's Laces, followed by Hedera, also in Lorna's Laces, because my local yarn store carried the stuff and I stocked up. I would hazard a guess in saying that Nitty is responsible for the most viral quality knits of the early 21st century. If you say monkey, 
Clapity Colorimetry, knitters instantly know what project you're referring to. Within a few years, a new crop of online knitting magazines would become available. The big names of this period are Twist Collective, Tangled, and Knit Circus. Twist Collective immediately shot to the top of the scene with a magazine layout that focused on photography, highlighting each project with a professional photographer's eye. It also featured a page-turn format that gave the feeling of actually flipping through a magazine. It wasn't as easy to scale or read on a cell phone, because mobile devices were becoming more popular due to the evolution of the iPod into the iPhone, but if you were sitting at a desktop, Twist was very pretty. Knit Circus began as a print publication in 2008 and transitioned online in 2010. Like Twist Collective, it featured a flip format. Again, great for desktops, not so much for mobile devices. Finally, we have Tangled. The premise behind the publication started in 2010 was to bring knitters and crocheters together rather than perpetuating the weird rivalry that seems to transpire on most online venues. Of all of these publications, only Knitty kept their content 100% free. Free to browse, free to cast on. Not only that, but while they keep the look and feel of the original layout, they continue to upgrade the back end to be responsive for new devices. Of all of these publications, it would seem that Knitty is the only survivor. The folks responsible for Twist Collective and Tangled have gone on to other enterprises, and Knit Circus now appears to be a storefront website. While it's wonderful that Knitty has survived the test of time, it does make one wonder. What's causing the disappearance of the online knitting publication? The answer may just circle right around to an observation about today's music made by ongoing history of new music's Alan Cross himself. In the episode Theories, Thoughts, and Half-Baked Ideas, air date January 12th, 2021, Cross posits that while the long format vinyl was crucial in making the album popular, physical albums made for a more musically diverse industry. If you bought a record or later a tape or CD, you purchased a collection of songs, and if you wanted to feel like you were getting your money's worth, you'd listen to the whole thing. The impetus was on bands to pre-produce a collection of singles to be published at the same time, and thus be able to sustain a band or an artist while they toured in support of the album. These days, artists are, for lack of a better term, encouraged by the streaming industry to produce music on a one-by-one -one single basis. Taylor made for play on streaming services such as Spotify or Apple Music. In order to satisfy a demand for an artist's music, a production team can conceivably drop a single at their leisure. A single that's tailor-made to get the most clicks. Heck, according to Cross, you don't even need to write a song as long as Stairway to Heaven or Layla. All you need is 30 seconds before someone clicks away. If you want to find out more about the darker side of Spotify in the music industry, there's a nice little video by Barely Sociable that talks about this sort of thing and how labels often take advantage of the new system. Links in the description. Funnily enough, Cross's theory is one that's been around for a while. When Weird Al Yankovic's recording contract was fulfilled a few years ago, he noted that with today's resources, he wouldn't need to produce a full album anymore. The danger being that by the time he'd recorded enough songs to justify a release, the shelf life of the parody would have already passed. Without the restriction of a contract, he could come up with an idea based on whatever struck him as trending at the time, record it at his own leisure in his home studio, and release it to the internet on his own. Which, when you think about it, is not just good news for Al, but also good news for anyone who likes timely comedy. What has this to do with Nitty? One word. Ravelry. At some point I'll get into the nitty-gritty, so to speak, of Ravelry. For now we can oversimplify things by saying Ravelry is the closest analog knitting and crochet has had to a streaming service. At first, Ravelry and Nitty seemed to work very symbiotically. If you weren't sure when Nitty's next issue would land, no fear. If you were the type of person who regularly checked out the pattern search page, chances were pretty good that you'd catch whenever all the new patterns would hit the database. They'd stick in the most popular spot at present, and then over time, fade into the trickle of new patterns coming in. Perhaps from Twist Collective or a commercial knitting company. These days, Ravelry is THE central hub for the knitting community. There are other community websites, sure, but despite a few setbacks, Ravelry maintains the largest database, forum engagement, and subscriber base. 
Their marketplace is so easy to use that a complete novice with a few Adobe InDesign skills can set themselves up as a professional designer in very little time. Ask me how I know this. <laughs> Links to my dubious pattern shop full of free and not so free patterns is generally available through the catch-all fake link tree in the description, but I'll add it in full so you can get an idea of what I mean by an amateur being able to set up their own shop. Thing is, if you're scared a magazine with taste like Nitty will reject your patterns for whatever reason, you can do it yourself. You don't have to be Lady Gaga when you could be Jonathan Colton. That's Possibly an obscure music reference, depending on how well you know your geek culture, but hey. I'd forgotten how quickly and easily a pair of monkeys work up. There's a reason we refer to knits like this as potato chip knitting. Because much like nomming a bowl of potato chips, it doesn't take long before you're done. And you probably have a craving for more, which is why some folks knit multiple pairs of monkey socks. The lace pattern spans 16 stitches and 11 rows, of which three rows are plain stockinette. What this means is four repetitions of each pattern per row makes for easy memorization, particularly when you're on the third or fourth full pattern repeat. Your brain is just a wee bit more engaged than if you were knitting plain stockinette socks, so you don't feel bored and you don't feel like putting the sock down. And depending on what yarn you use, you can have all sorts of fun with flashing and pooling or gradations or odd speckles that just crop up every so often in the yarn. I chose a now discontinued loops and threads yarn from Michaels that works on a somewhat striped color gradient, made sort of heathery by spinning two different colored strands together. So it's very purple teal. However, this pattern became popular around the time indie dyers became popular, so while the yarn base might be commercially spun, the yarn's colors were often fairly unique. Socks are kind of like a choose-your-own-adventure story. The pattern specifies a twisted rib stitch cuff for one inch, and I prefer a knit two purl two cuff for 20 rounds, which is pretty much double. Yes, 20 rounds, my patience for knitting cuffs has increased as I've aged. I can remember a day when I'd lose patience with cuffs after five rounds and try to convince myself that this was fine. It's not fine. 10 rounds was my standard for quite a while until I finally owned up to the fact that my cuffs were wimpy and now my socks have 20 rounds and are downright beefy. I like a beefy cuff. But the pattern also specifies a plain stockinette heel flap and I prefer the extra sturdiness of slip one, knit one. I think it's a standard Dutch heel, so I basically just went on autopilot until I started working on the gusset decreases and pattern over the top of the foot. Which, those three rounds of stockinette in the pattern come in really handy. Because when you finish turning your heel and you have to start across the top of the foot, you don't even have to think about it. You knit those 32 stitches plain and the next time you come around to the top of the foot, you continue in the pattern. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Of course, this is usually where I get bored and start putting down the sock because those gusset decreases can be long and boring. With this pattern, you generally have nine heel stitches and pick up anywhere from 15 to 17 down the side, depending on how you chose to complete your heel. That's a total of 52 stitches, 26 per side, that you have to reduce down to 32, or 16 per side. So if you're reducing by two stitches every second round, it can take a while. Best to soldier on through the toe, put on a TV show or a movie, snuggle up in a blanket, and knit the afternoon away. Once you get past the gusset, things speed up considerably, as you only knit the lace pattern on the top of the foot and can zoom across the bottom of the foot and stockinette. Stop using the lace pattern once you have enough length for the foot and start the toe decreases. The pattern suggests decreasing up to a grand total of 28 stitches, which you divide between two needles and graft. Kitchener stitch for those of you who want to look up the technique. Did I mention that Nitty has articles on technique? Yes, those would be the articles we generally ignored in favor of yarn p until, of course, you actually have to graft a toe, or choose a stretchy cast on, or, depending on need, a stretchy bind off, or maybe you need a provisional cast on. 
Even better, they mix up the articles and patterns because for a while there, Franklin Habit was translating antique patterns out of some of the resources cost tubers like us use to make things like knit fichus and kneecaps and gaiters. Dude figured out how to make an antique pineapple purse. It's fantastic. You should check it out. In 2015, after continued difficulties with advertising revenue, Nitty moved to a Patreon model of support. I'll link their Patreon in the description below, and I really do encourage anyone who loves to knit and can afford to become a patron to do so. They have tiers as low as $3, Canadian as far as I can see, and perks that include a message board, coupons, and hangouts dependent on tier. They're currently sitting at nearly 3,000 patrons out of their goal of 5,000, and pledges go on an issue-by-issue -issue basis rather than monthly. In winter 2020, Nitty produced their 74th issue. Patterns include an innovative pair of gloves knit on the bias, a long winter toque inspired by pixies, and the stereotypical gentleman's nightcap, a stranded sweater, a stash buster shawlette, and a pair of knee-high socks. As always, Nitty's professional presentation shines through with each project photo. My plus size knitters? Check out Perchta in first fall 2020. It is a gorgeous cardigan with extra long sleeves and cabled motifs. It is, as Ms. Maxie would say, chef's kiss. The shame of it is it's only been cast on six times. I mean, seriously. If you're a seasoned nitty lover who has lost their way from the magazine, there's still plenty to delight. And for those new to nitty who may have missed this phenomenon in the churn from Ravelry's Hot Right Now section, you have so much to discover. Speaking of discovery, if this is your first time here, welcome! If you enjoyed this video, you may wish to hit the thumbs up button down below, possibly subscribe if you aren't already. I'll totally understand if you want to check out a couple more videos first. My videos run the gamut of sewing and traditional handicrafts, so if you're here for the sweet yarn content or just want to see someone try to figure out the basics of modern historical costuming, you're in the right place. My grandfather always used to say you'll never make the same mistake twice. He's right. I keep finding entirely new ways to make those mistakes. Till then, 